The reading today is from John 20, verses 1 to 18, and it's on page 880 in the Pew Bibles. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, and said, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they have put him. So Peter and the other disciple started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over and looked in at the strips of linen, lying there, but did not go in. Then Simon Peter came along behind him and went straight into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head. The cloth was still lying in its place, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, also went inside. He saw and believed. They still did not understand from scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to where they were staying. Now Mary stood outside the tomb crying. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white, seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. They asked her, woman, why are you crying? They have taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they have put him. At this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realise that it was Jesus. He asked her, Woman, why are you crying? Who is it you are looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him and I will get him. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned towards him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said, Do not hold on to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am ascending to my father and your father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news, I have seen the Lord, and she told them that he had said these things to her. way uh, to meet uh, the risen Lord. She came to meet a king. Do you know that God uh, gives us a picture of the coming king? Um, In the Old Testament, uh, it was the king named David. He was a king foreshadowing uh, the king that would come. A hundred years before Jesus was born, David was anointed king when he was just a little shepherd boy. And like Jesus before him, he suffered terribly before he ascended uh, to the throne and stepped into his authority. He became the greatest king that um, Israel ever knew. And before he died, God made a promise to him which was a breathtaking promise in 2 Samuel 7. God said to him, I will raise up your offspring to succeed you, your own flesh and blood, and I will establish his kingdom, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. How could ever a forever promise like that ever be fulfilled? God says, I'm going to raise up one of your own sons who will reign on your throne forever. But now, on this first Easter morning, in a surprisingly beautiful way and an astonishingly powerful way, this descendant of David, Jesus, 
fulfills that promise. He fulfills it in a way more powerful and more magnificent that could ever have been imagined, actually. And before we look at this text in John chapter 20 about the resurrection of Jesus, I just want to think with you about the glimpses we see of the resurrection in the first king, in this King David. Do you remember, Saul had been king and he'd been hunting David down to kill him. And amidst a certain terrible battle, there's this horrible occasion where Saul uh, takes his own life. And now the throne of Israel is vacant. There's no king. But soon, after this event, people come from all over Israel to Hebron, where David is. And they say to him, David, you were always the one who won our battles. You were the mighty warrior. We, we know that God has promised you long ago that you would be king. We are your flesh and blood. That's actually what they say. They say, we are your flesh and blood. <laughs> we, we, we belong to you. Be our king. Be our king. Rule over us. And so this massive army of men with weapons come from all directions. They come from all directions. And I just love to imagine it, actually. From all over the country, here they come. And in actual fact, in 1 Chronicles 12, it lists them and it says, These are the numbers of the men armed for battle who came to David at Hebron to turn Saul's kingdom over to him, as the Lord had said. And then it names them, says from Judah, there was about 6,800. 6, from Simeon, there was about 7,000. It goes on. And all the different tribes, different thousands of, of these warriors coming to David to make him king. And I added them all up and there's about 300,000. So now imagine from all over the, the nation coming, streaming to him. It's, it's in my mind a, a moment of great wonder that this true long-awaited king who had suffered for so, so long has got these people of Israel coming to him willingly to come under his authority, deep loyalty to him that in a covenant that flows from God. And this David who has suffered so much, if you know the story, so, so much, is now rewarded in the sense that he becomes this exalted king over a vast ar army a shepherd king over this great army. But you know, as I think about this, it wasn't just about David and his kingship because it was about those who came to him as well. Because as they come to him, it's like, it seems to me anyway, it like, it's like that they're getting a new identity. That they're coming, that there's just great joy. That this old king that used to lead them astray and bring every kind of terrible thing in their life, they're now getting this new identity and they are being owned by the true king, by a mighty king. They're being owned by him. They, 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 they long to be under him. They were surrendering, but because of how great they knew that he was, it was a joy for them to come under his rule. And in a sense, they were receiving power even as they came and knew his rule. And when I think about that, I think this is a picture of the resurrection and of the ascension of Christ. These Israelites are like us. They're, we willingly come. They were willingly coming to David and just as they were giving themselves and all their weapons and surrendering under his authority, they're no longer laboring under a king that was a curse and was destroying their lives. They're coming under a king that makes them new. <laughs> and now being made new under this great and holy king. And so for us too, when we come to the one who reigns, that's true. Do you know what? 
You're getting a new identity. Me too. We are being made new. We are receiving power. And we are receiving light because we are becoming part of him. Part of who he is. So now if we now then turn our attention just for a few moments to this passage that Kathy read for us. I want to think about this kingly rule and I want to think about the deep love, the real power and the new belonging. First of all, a deep love. I don't know whether you think like this, but, but when I think about when Jesus rises from the dead, now not just a king over a few Philistines or a few nations here and there, but now a king of unparalleled proportions, king over all, <laughs> conquering death and now ruling. When I think about that, I would have thought that when Jesus, having suffered so terribly on the Friday and being whipped and flogged half to death and then actually dying on the cross, I would have thought that when he rose, he would have gathered these 12 legions of angels that were awaiting and he would have got into a chariot of fire and he would have, in a great display of majesty, he would have declared himself king. <laughs> but is it not totally amazing that the very first appointment that Jesus makes in his risen authority, is it not amazing? The very first thing that he does is he meets this woman. Mary Magdalene, in a garden, weeping. That's how he displays himself. That is his first appearance. And I'm saying to you that this is a display of the true king and he comes in deep love. That's how he exercises his great authority. He comes in deep love. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and the saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. And later on, here she is. Now Mary stood outside the tomb crying. And Jesus comes to her and says, Woman, why are you crying? It's his first resurrected words. And she says, she thinks, she thinks he's a gardener. And she says, look, sir, if, if you put him somewhere, could you tell me? Because I'll, I'll get him. And Jesus calls her name and says, Mary. And as soon as she calls her name, just like he always had done, she sees him, she recognises him, and she says, Rabboni. And she holds on to him. Look, this resurrected king, in all his power, uses his great kingly authority to come and to meet in a very loving and personal way this precious woman. This king is still alive. And that's how he exercises his kingly authority today too. He comes to us. We don't actually know too much about Mary Magdalene. What we do know about her is that the scriptures say that seven demons had been come out of her and her mind and her soul had been ripped badly by darkness in the past. And... And so she had been a mess. But this king had made her new again. And now he comes to her as she weeps in her brokenness. And I want you to know this morning that this king, the King Jesus, 
the king of all, comes to you very personally. You're just not a number. You're just not someone that he just sort of looks at at afar. He comes to you. He comes to me. In all our weakness, and in all our brokenness, he comes to those that are broken and contrite in spirit. Those of us who are damaged, which is all of us. And he comes with deep love. Deep love. And calls your name. A name that would restore you. A name that would give you a whole new life. In a similar way, do you notice when he comes to the disciples? Again, the, the doors are locked for fear of the Jews. The disciples are locked in there. That evening, Jesus comes and he stands amongst them and he says, Peace be with you. And after that, it says that he... He roars around in a great chariot. No, I'll tell you what he does. He doesn't display his, his own power and his own might like that. What he says is, my identifier is the scars. I'll show you who I am. I'll show you, who, I'll show you how I'm identified. <laughs> I'm identified by my scars. That's what sets me apart. I've come down to meet you in all your brokenness and pain. And, 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 and the thing that is, I want you to see is my scars for you. And so this king comes to us in love. It's amazing the way he comes to us. But secondly, think of this king and he comes in real power. He says to Mary when she's clinging on to him in the garden, she says to him, do not hold on to me for I've not yet ascended to my father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them I'm ascending to my father and to your father, to my God and your God. I'm ascending. I'm ascending. I I've conquered all the powers of darkness here on earth. And, and I'm ascending um, to this throne by my father, the great throne, where I will be stepping into my authority and rulership. And, and, and Jesus is doing that because he's drawing a vast army, as it were, to himself. We are part of that army. All over the world right now, there is, Jesus is drawing to himself people because he's on the throne and he's beginning to renew all things make all things new you know how broken our world is you are, you you know it better than i do we all know it but but this king is ascending to the father and he's making all things new that's what he ultimately will do a new creation do you know when Jesus, our bodies, our bodies, they are perishable. But when Jesus' body rose from the dead, it is an imperishable body. It is unbreakable body. And he is the very first fruits of an unbreakable new creation that he is going to ultimately bring to pass. And he is bringing it to pass, even even today, it's real power. And he says, when he comes to the disciples later on that evening, he says to them, he comes to them, and do you know what he does? Something very strange. It says here in verse 22 that he breathed on them. Can you imagine that? He breathed on them. And he said, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone their sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. He breathed on them. They are locked. They're frightened of the Jews. They think that they're going to be the next to get the wrath of the Jews. And Jesus comes and stands among them. And he actually breathes on them. And he says, receive the Holy Spirit. 
What's he saying? He's saying, I'm, 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 what does this king do with his authority? Well, he shares his kingly breath with them. He shares with him from his, from his very self. Do you remember that the Holy Spirit in, I think in Hebrew is ruach, which means the breath of God. <laughs> and so now here is the risen king breathing on his disciples and for it's for a spiritual life. I mean, we've got, I've got, you've all breathing right now. And I've got breath in our bodies, but it's an earthly breath. But what Jesus is giving to his disciples now that he's risen is a spiritual life, a spiritual breath that only he can do and only he can give now because he's died and risen again. He's paid for the sins, washed all the disciples clean, and now he breathes and he says, I'm giving you my spirit. It's the gift that the Father and Jesus had longed to give. The gift of the Spirit. And brothers and sisters, we too, for all of us who trust in Christ, receive a totally unpaid for and unmerited gift from God. It's the gift of the Spirit and it's the most precious thing that he and the Father could imagine giving to us his spirit. It's a spirit of power. And lastly, so we've thought about a deep love. We've talked about a real power in the gift of the spirit. But think with me lastly about a new belonging. A new belonging. Do you know, Jesus said to Mary... I'm ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Before this, Jesus had talked about his Father, but he says now he's yours as well. You belong to him. If you belong to me, if you're under my rule, then you totally belong. <laughs> you, you are not your own anymore. You belong. It's a deep, deep belonging. And in his rising, he's, he's bringing in this great welcome. <laughs> Come in. You belong. And Jesus says to the disciples later, he says, As my Father has sent me, so I am sending you. Do you know, Jesus says, How? I'll just ask you a question. How did the Father send Jesus? Well, he sent him with a great purpose. To bring light to a dark world. To bring love to a world that was totally bereft of all love. To bring life where there was only death. And Jesus, in his life for his Father... I'll tell you one thing that, I, uh, that we know is that he was incredibly obedient. Like there was just this deep obedience and dependence on his father. And that's how he walked through this life. This deep obedience to his father. And Jesus now says to the disciples, as my father sent me, so I'm sending you. You belong to this mission now. You belong to what, <laughs> to what God is doing in me. You're, it's not just me doing something. You're in it. You're commissioned. I'm, breathe, ha, I'm breathing on you. And you're receiving my spirit. And as my Father sent me, so I'm sending you to a wonderful purpose. For light and life in the world. So sisters and brothers... We haven't seen the end of this yet. The king has not come a second time yet to put down all evil and, and finish all evil and put down all enemies. It hasn't happened yet. But it will happen. In his might and in his power, it will happen. And we are drawn into this now. 
as those that trust in Christ. We're part of the new creation coming as we trust and love the Lord. There are discouragements in this world. Many of you know, many of you are suffering right now. Many of you turn on the TV or read the internet or whatever and you say, wow, where is this world going? And that is true. But I'll tell you something. There is a king on the throne and he's establishing his kingdom and he's drawing us to be part of what he's doing for his glory to make this world new, for life to come and for light to come. He comes with deep, deep love. He comes, he comes to you with real power. Yes, he does. And he comes for a whole new belonging, for us to be part of what he is doing in this world. I'm thankful to the Lord. I'm thankful to you, Lord. We're thankful to you, Lord, um, that this is the kind of king that we get to serve. Let me pray with you. And we'll sing our last song. Lord, with these other precious ones that have gathered here, in lots of ways we come like Mary in all our brokenness. But you come to us uh, with such love, with such power, and with such welcome in that we could belong to you in a holy and new way. And we praise you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.